Welcome to Healthy Focus, the Duke Raleigh Hospital Community Education Series. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ben Hopkins. Thank you very much. I've got a little bit of a loud voice. All right, he's going to fix that. Um, a lot of people ask me why I'm a colorectal surgeon. It's a dirty job, and not too many people understand it. And I did have a choice between vascular surgery or colorectal. I can't tell you why I like food better than blood. But as you'll see in these slides, uh, there's a lot of benefits to what we do. And one thing that we can do is to help people cure colon cancer with screening colonoscopies. We can find polyps before they become tumors and take them out. With colon cancer, sur cancer surgery, I have a good chance of curing people. And then as you're going to see from the, as you're going to see from the slides tonight, I have a very good chance of helping people with a lot of problems around their body. It's not something that people like to talk about, and that's why I'm very happy to have this venue to talk to you about all these things that usually shut down a dinner conversation when somebody asks us about what I do. <laughs> I will give you a little warning. The reason why we don't serve food is because of some of the slides that I'm going to put up. I did run them by my um, soon-to-be mother-in-law. She's approved them for y'all's viewing. Um, but if any, if any slides look offensive, just raise your hand and get this to there anymore. There are very few actual pictures because I wanted to try to keep the gross factor down just a little bit. But what I wanted to go over today, if I can get this to work. There we go. Is I want to talk about the anatomy and physiology of the anus and the rectum how it's working for us, what's going on down there. It's not a black box, it's not a black hole. So we know what, we know colorectal surgeons, gastroenterologists, we understand what's going on. Talk about symptoms of the disease, how to know when you're having a certain problem, the management, what we're gonna do about it. And then I wanna to talk to you about the team that you, I wanna to talk to you about the team that you're gonna get, which is gonna be myself and Dr. Farkas when you come to do crawling colorectal surgery. So um, this is our Halloween get up from when we first got here. So shockingly, there's a, our mascot is the Fleet's Enema Man. <laughs> That's this little guy right down here. So he does exist. It's not just a made up costume. Hemorrhoids are something that everybody knows about. And nobody wants to have them. And I got a secret for you. There are two things I want you to remember from the end of the night. One is that everybody in this room and their grandkids or kids or whoever all have hemorrhoids. It's a natural thing. God gave them to us, and I'll explain why. The other thing I want you to remember is that we can actually do things for fecal incontinence. So it's not something that you have to live with. What they are, they're actually vascular sinusoids. They're part of natural human anatomy. And they are present at birth, and they cushion the anus. And they actually, they actually give us help with continence. So having that extra tissue down there gives the anus something that they, they can use to squeeze down on to act as a flat valve so when you have liquid stool or solid stool uh, more voice <laughs> so if you have liquid stool or solid stool that it will actually help to prevent any leaking and it help you to maintain your continence um, and it is the most common cause of bright red painless bleeding that said we always have to make sure that there's not something else scary going on before we do before we do our workout what they're not is varicose veins. A lot of people are confused about that. So these are actually naturally occurring venous complexes within the anus. Over a period of time, they can become engorged and start sliding, which I'll show you how. And again, they act as vascular cushions. And then they're actually interconnected with the smooth muscle of the anus. So as the rectum comes down, you see the rectal wall right here coming down and it starts the internal anal sphincter and there are fibrovascular bundles that connect the hemorrhoid column to the, to the rectum and to the anus. And then over time what happens is that these hemorrhoid columns will start to slip and actually become detached from the rectal wall or from the uh, musculature of the anus and they can actually slip outside and when that happens you have mucosa which is the lining of the colon or the lining of the rectum which is supposed to be on the inside, it's exposed to the outside world. It secretes mucus, it's wet, and it causes a lot of irritation and itching. The location of these things 
a lot of people think about it as the clock face. I prefer to think about it where their anatomic positions are because if I have a patient on their back or if I have a patient on their stomach, or excuse me, on their stomach or on their back, it matters for where it's going to be. So on the left side, you have a single column, and on the right posterior towards the bottom, and then on the right anterior position are where your other hemorrhoid columns are. So you got three, and again, they're supposed to be there. We've got different classifications of hemorrhoids. So you can have external tags, and what those are is it's just redundant tissue. A lot of patients will come into my office complaining that they can't quite get themselves clean because they have these extra folds down there that kind of inhibit being able to keep clean. You can have external hemorrhoids, which are when your hemorrhoids actually protrude out to the perianal skin, and that involves the uh, hemorrhoid columns on the outside, as you can see right here. And then you have the internal hemorrhoids, which are the ones on the inside, and they're painless. You don't feel those because of their location. When you look at the anus, there's a transition zone right in here where you don't have any more skin sensation. So what that means is that if I were to touch your skin, you could tell me exactly where I'm touching you. But once I get above that line, the sensory innervation is different, and you, won't, you don't feel it. And so that's why internal hemorrhoids aren't going to hurt you. The grades of internal hemorrhoids, so grade one is what all of us have. So that's what we're born with. They stay where they are and they're supposed to be there. Grade two is when they pop out with a bowel movement or with straining, but then without straining, they naturally go back in. So a lot of patients that come into my office, I ask them if things are coming out of their bottom, they look at me like I'm from Mars, and I have to give them the universal push it back up symbol and they understand what I'm talking about. And that's when we get to grade three, which is when you manually reduce. So that's when the hemorrhoid actually falls out of the anus and then patients have to push it back up into the, into the anus. Grade four is when they're strangulated and they won't go back in. And then I actually worry about vascular necrosis and ischemia, which is damage to the tissue because it fills with blood because the arterial blood flow is high. The venous blood flow is very low and there's a low pressure system. So the blood becomes trapped, it gets engorged, and it can actually cause damage and um, bleed and die in necrosis. And then there's a mixed component where the hemorrhoid will slide out and actually become internal hemorrhoids will combine with the external hemorrhoids and just have a mixed component, the whole column will slide out. Again, internal hemorrhoids are painless. Um, things that I worry about, I worry about rectal cancer and I worry about proctitis, which is inflammation of the rectum. External hemorrhoids are the ones that are going to hurt. And those are the people that you see, they can't sit down, they try to find a pillow to sit on, or they try to find a donut that we're going to talk about. Um, and those can be thrombosed hemorrhoids, but it could also be an anal fissure. It could also be paritis ani, which is a technical term for itchy bottom. And then it could also be an anal cancer, which would certainly be concerning that we would want to sit and find out about. As far as evaluation, when they come to my office, we're going to get a history, we're going to find out what the nature of all the bleeding is, and then we're going to do a physical exam. Um, everybody's going to have an anoscopy, and I'll show you what that is in a moment. It's not as scary as it sounds. And then everybody needs to get a flexible sigmoidoscope, and the reason why is to evaluate the rectum to make sure that there's no lesion there. And then if, they're, if they meet criteria, so they're over 50 and haven't had a colonoscopy yet, or if there's a family history of colon cancer, or if there's a family history of polyps, then that person needs to have a full colonoscopy to evaluate the entire colon. A flexible sigmoidoscope will only evaluate the beginning or the, me, the end of the colon, and not check the whole thing. And this is the anoscope. This is my wonderful nurse, Dory, and she likes the small one. And it's a small device that we use to put into the rectum so that we can evaluate the hemorrhoid columns. Again, symptoms are going to be bright red bleeding, whether or not tissue is coming out of the bottom, if people are having pain or discomfort, and that pain is typically of a burning and an itching nature when it comes to hemorrhoids. If somebody comes to me and they tell me they have a stabbing sensation, like a hot poker's been put up there, or like a paper cut of the anus, then I'm worried about other syndromes. They'll also have mucus drainage because there's actually exposure of mucosa coming outside of the rectum. So that should be inside with all the moisture. It's like a mucous membrane. It's the best way to describe it. So that makes people's underwear moist and they don't like it. And it causes them to have some soiling as well. So people come into my office and they tell me that they have fecal smearing, which is when they take off their underpants and they're staining a stool onto their underpants, which is very embarrassing. 
So what else could it be? I mean, part of the reason why you're coming to my office is for one thing, we want to make sure it's amyloids. For another thing, we want to make sure it's not something scary. We've talked about some of these being abscesses, anal cancer, whether or not it's condyloma, which is a papillomavirus, and it can cause anal cancer as well, just like condyloma can cause cervical cancer, whether or not it's an anal papilla, which is a normal thing, and then also if there's rectal prolapse or if there's any evidence of rectal carcinoma. The scary thing coming up is this guy. So this is a thrombose tymoid, and this is the one that sends everybody up the wall. And the trick with this is that I need to see you in my office within 48 hours in order for me to be able to do anything substantial to try to relieve the pain. Unfortunately, a lot of times patients will come to me on day four, day five, it still hurts, but it's actually getting better, it's starting to soften up, and it's not as acute as it was. And at that point, any surgical intervention that I do is going to cause more pain than that actually than the hemorrhoid itself. So if somebody comes to me in the first couple of days, I can cut this off and relieve them of that acute initial pain that's 10 out of 10, makes them not want to sit down, makes them you know, feel like I call 10 out of 10 pain that you want to scream and die and crawl on the floor. If I'm going to watch them, if they haven't come to me in time for me to be able to take this off with surgery, which I'm going to show you in a few minutes, what we'll do is we'll have them soak in a warm hot tub because that's going to actually improve the blood flow and it's going to help to soften up that blood clot, which is what's causing the pain from the tension on the skin. You have them take Tylenol and Advil, with Advil being an anti-inflammatory and Tylenol for pain. And then we have topical anal, analgesic, so basically lidocaine creams. Analpram is a good drug of choice. It has a little bit of a steroid cream in it, which helps you to have uh, decreased swelling, helps this thing to decrease in size, and it also has a little bit of a topical anesthetic in order to numb up the skin. We want to put people on stool softeners, but I don't want to put them on stool softeners for too long because as, we'll, as you'll see, I'm going to increase the fiber in their diet, which is hopefully going to do the same thing and help them out. And again, that's when I start the fiber and water talk, which nobody believes me that it works, but I, I promise you that it does. This is what I really don't want to see. And this is grade four hem. These are grade four hemorrhoids. So here, you actually have prolapse of the entire hemorrhoid out on all sides. And it's, you can see how it's ugly and gnarled and congested. And if this patient doesn't get an operation soon, that's going to actually become ischemic and die. Do you want me to be able to differentiate between these two? This is, again, thrombose hemorrhoids, but this is another animal when you actually have full-on rectal prolapse. And that's when the rectum is actually coming out of the anus and sliding out. And a lot of people see this and they assume that because it's down there at the bottom that it's hemorrhoids, but really it's rectal prolapse. Again, we want to work on your diet, and I want, you, I want people to be on bulk forming agents so that they have easy to pass stools, and we'll use the topical creams, and then we can talk about office procedures, but before I get into office procedures, I have always try the first two for about six weeks and see if people get better before I start instrumenting the anus, and I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. And then the last thing I'll tell you about is the hemorrhoid surgeries. The most common one that's been around for a long time is the most painful thing that I can ever do to a person, which is why I try to avoid it, by getting people onto their proper diet. The most important thing is going to be getting your fiber up to 25 grams a day. And you have to understand that an apple is about three to four grams of fiber, depending on the size of the apple that you get. So unless you're, and everybody comes to my office and they tell me that they're on a high fiber diet and they talk to me about the whole wheat foods that they eat, but unless somebody can actually come to me and tell me they get 30 grams, tell me they get 25 grams, and be able to point to their diet, and, know that, and I know that they've read the nutrition label and they see how much fiber is in the food, I pretty much count on people getting 10 grams, which is a third of what you should get during the day. The only people I trust for, um, about this would be vegetarians who are coming into my office who get all fiber foods. Um, raisin bran is going to be about 9 grams. You can find high fiber uh, oatmeal, which will be about nine grams as well. And then a lot of patients will tell me that they eat a lot of lettuce. But lettuce, unfortunately, doesn't have a lot of fiber in it. And the analogy that I give is that if you, you know, I like, I like cooked spinach a lot. So if you take spinach and you take a large salad bowl of it and you can render it down and it'll cook down to half a cup. And that half a cup is three grams of fiber. So that gives you an idea of how much salad you need to eat just to get three grams of fiber. And I don't think that anybody's eating 10 salads a day in order to get that fiber load. So that, I try to use that as an explanation of why a salad's not enough. 
And then with that, to avoid the opposite effect of getting constipated on fiber, patients have to drink at least 64 ounces of water a day. It's two liters, it sounds like a lot, but it's just like mom told us when we were growing up. It's eight, eight ounce glasses of water, which is what we should all try to get. You can get nice supplements for your fiber. So here we've got our nice grains, we've got broccoli, sweet potatoes, things like that. But oftentimes people find that it's hard to hit the mark. And sometimes my patients, especially if they're trying to use grains and oats in order to increase their fiber load, they actually get a large carbohydrate load and they start gaining weight and they're not happy about that. So I try to push those patients more towards eating legumes and greens, but then also using supplement materials like Metamucil or Benafiber or Citrusel, which are good products to use to help bulk up the stool. A lot of my patients came to me and told me about these fiber gummies, which are really tasty and good and provide a good amount of fiber. And Fiber One is a good product, but I want to counsel you that when you're going out and you're reading your food labels, that a lot of foods use inulin, which is also chicory root, as their fiber, as their main fiber component. And you'll see it on the label. And the problem with inulin is that it's a large sugar molecule that holds water into the stool. It does help to soften the stool, and it's a great fiber product for that. But if patients are coming to me with symptoms like fecal smearing, or with itching in their bottom, or irritation, this, this product can actually make it a little bit worse because it's adding more water and your stool will stick to the skin and that's what's causing the irritation. So I prefer products like psyllium husk, which is what is in Metamucil, in order to help the stool stick to itself and stick less to your anus so that you have less irritation. The other complaint I get is that fiber causes bloating and um, people don't want to have to pass gas and they don't want to have a lot of bloating cramping pain. But the trick for that is to go up slowly on your fiber load. If you can increase your fiber load by five grams a day per week, that will help you the most towards making sure that <clears throat> you're avoiding this bloating, cramping feeling in your belly. And then if you start increasing your fiber load, you get to a point where your belly hurts, or you find that you're having excessive gas, you back off on the amount of fiber and go up even more slowly. But your body will adjust, and it, it's not something that you'll have to be dealing with the whole time that you're on a high fiber diet. I also tell people to do lifestyle changes. So a lot of guys, I'm, I'm sure that there's nobody in this room that knows this story, but the guys will go into the bathroom and they'll take the newspaper with them and they'll be there for about 20, 30 minutes and it's private time in order to enjoy themselves with the paper and just have some relaxation time. But that also causes increased pressure in the perineum, you get vascular congestion. So what my old boss taught me to do, or taught me to tell patients, excuse me, is to you know, tell them to do their business, the optimal bowel movement is going to be about two, three minutes, minimal wiping, um, not much on the toilet paper when you clean up, stand up, turn the toilet seat down so that you're on a flat surface, sit back down and then read your paper. <laughs> but the idea again is that I don't want you straining because straining is going to increase vascular pressure on the hemorrhoid columns and increase the congestion that's going to cause them to prolapse and have problems. As far as hemorrhoid management, it hurts. People want a solution really quick, and it's hard to come to my office and be told that fiber is going to make you better when your bottom's hurting. And so a lot of people will go out and they'll get this nice, wonderful donut to sit on, and as I said, with the toilet bowl, it increases the amount of pressure in the perineum. The donut's also going to increase the amount of pressure in your, in your perineum. It's going to increase the vascular congestion and actually make your hemorrhoids worse. So I want you to avoid the donut if you're having trouble with your hemorrhoids. There are lots of things that I can do in my office when I'm taking care of um, hemorrhoids. So after I've maximized someone on their diet and I've gotten them to where I've screened their colon to make sure that it's just hemorrhoids that are bleeding, that they don't have a colon cancer or a rectal cancer. And after I've given them at least six weeks or maybe even 12 weeks to see if they'll get better with fiber management, then I can do some things in my office such as rubber band ligation. There's even infrared coagulation sclerotherapy and cryosurgery. Cryosurgery has fallen off because we worry about having necrosis. It's difficult for us to manage the depth of penetration. So it's fallen off. But the first three are very easy and simple to do office procedures. And what we do is we want to destroy that hemorrhoid column, but we also want to secure the, the sliding mucosa up to the, up to the uh, rectal wall again, or up to the anus. So the rubber band or the sclerotherapy or the infrared coagulation will actually destroy the vessels that are leading down into the hemorrhoid column so that you don't have blood flowing into it. But then also it causes a scar reaction so that the mucosa will actually stick to the muscle. 
So if you look at your skin, as we get older, our skin becomes more pliant and you can pick up more of it and it doesn't stick to your muscles as well as it used to. The hemorrhoids are the same. And so when I take the, when I take the um, heat or if I take a rubber band, it causes scarring and it causes it to stick in that same area. If anybody's had surgery on their belly or surgery anywhere else, they might have seen this where you have scar tissue at the side of the incision and it kind of puckers sometimes. If your belly is full, the incision actually is sticking down and that's because of the scar tissue that's been there and formed. And this is what the rubber band ligator looks like for us, similar to the one that I use in my office. This is a suction rubber band ligator. Um, we started putting rubber bands on hemorrhoids back in the 50s. It's very safe, it's a very simple thing to do in the office. It means putting the anoscope, that very small instrument that you saw into the anus, using this to actually find the hemorrhoid. And this is just a pictogram showing where, in this instance, they're grabbing up the hemorrhoid here, and pulling it down, and then down here at C, you can actually see the rubber band on the hemorrhoid. And this is another picture showing it. And this is an older style hemorrhoid band ligator where I actually pinch it up in one instrument, push this down onto it, put my rubber band on, and then you can see that it actually pulls that hemorrhoid up and puts the rubber band at the base. So that causes the tissue itself to strangulate. So it will eventually die and fall off. Just like if you tied a string around your finger, it would turn black and fall off. And so with that, you lose that extra tissue and you get some scarring that keeps the rest of the hemorrhoid column from sliding down. Of course, anything that I do has a complication. And so one of the wonderful things about surgery is that I can fix people very quickly. However, as I like to tell people, surgery can never not do harm. So if I can fix you without having to do, an, do a surgery or do an instrumentation, then that's what you want because unfortunately there are perils to everything. It's a very low complication rate. You can see that if sepsis is when someone is very sick and has an infection, it has to be in the intensive care unit. <laughs> However, you know, we worry about that with, with rubber band ligators. It's 0.5%, but if, that's, if that 0.5% happens to be you, that's a problem. It can also cause urinary retention because the nerves in the pelvis are integrally related. So the rectum is um, very close to the bladder, the nerves are interrelated, and it can paralyze the bladder and cause it to spasm and not work. So patients sometimes have to come to the hospital and have a fully catheter put in to drain the bladder. And then there's always a sense of rectal fullness because when you think about it, when stool is in the rectum, it sends a signal to the brain that says, hey, I gotta go to the bathroom. Well, I've just put rubber bands in the rectum. That's a space occupying thing. It sends a signal to the brain saying, hey, I've gotta go to the bathroom, but all it is is the rubber band. But again, the risks are very minimal, which is why we do this in the office and we do this a lot. But this is also why when someone comes to my office, I try to work on their diet first, give them the six weeks, give them the old college try, give them six weeks to get better, and if not, then we put some rubber bands on. The infrared coagulator is a nice instrument that actually applies heat at the top of the hemorrhoid column. Um, it does, patients don't feel pain because again, I'm up in that area of the anus where there's no skin sensation, so you're not going to actually feel that heat. And very rarely do, they, do patients have problems with bleeding afterwards. And what it does is we actually go to the top of the hemorrhoid column in, in four areas, apply the heat just right at where the artery and the vein is to the hemorrhoid column, and that will help with the bleeding. And then again, it will cause scarring and it will cause that hemorrhoid column to pexy. Personally, I think this is a great way of taking care of grade one and grade two hemorrhoids. So those are the hemorrhoids that are not sliding out or the hemorrhoids that are sliding out but automatically come back in on their own. I'm not so sure that this is the best device for hemorrhoids that are coming out that patients actually have to push back in on their own. And then lastly, we can do sclerotherapy, which is when we actually inject a phenol oil. So it's an oil that gets into the artery that feeds the hemorrhoid and it causes it to coagulate and sclerose. So the blood's no longer flowing in there. It stops the blood flow to that section. And depends on which surgeon you talk to. Some surgeons like to start with this. Uh, in my practice, we use this sort of as a, as a last agent. We've done a lot of things for their hemorrhoids. We haven't been able to get them to stop bleeding. There's not a lot of redundant tissue in there for me to be able to put a rubber band on. And those are the patients that I'm gonna do sclerotherapy on. So now we get to surgical treatment. And again, this is a great way to get rid of hemorrhoids, but the first way that I'll talk to you about is the most painful thing that we can do to people. And what I tell patients is that for about two to three weeks, it's gonna feel like glass shards are coming out. So if I can, afford, if I can avoid a standard three-column hemorrhoidectomy on a patient, 
I will. However, if it's necessary, it's necessary. When we're going to do it, if patients are symptomatic, so they continue to have bleeding, even after management with rubber band ligation, even after management with fiber therapy um, or sclerotherapy. It's used for internal hemorrhoids mostly. Um, with external hemorrhoids, we'll cut them off if they're in that acute, again, within the first 48 hours acute event. And then also if patients are having a lot of mucosal prolapse, because when I do the surgery, I'm actually cutting that hemorrhoid out and I'm cutting away the extra tissue that's prolapsing out. It requires coming into the operating room. Patients are placed on their stomach, and usually they get what's called MAC anesthesia or monitored anesthesia care. So it's enough medicine to make you fall asleep, but not enough to make you need to have a breathing tube. And then we use anesthetics in the bottom to numb it up. And then after that, we're able to do our, do our work down there. And this is what we do during the surgery. We actually grab the hemorrhoid here, and this, of course, is while the patient's asleep, we've already numbed them up. But we grab the hemorrhoid, we lift it up, and then you can see this is actually fatty tissue up under the skin that everybody has in their bottom. This here is part of the external anal sphincter, and then it's gonna, you're going to start seeing the internal anal sphincter. So you can see that you want, to make sure, you want me to make sure that I'm protecting those muscles and not cutting through them and not taking them out with the hemorrhoid. And then afterwards, we actually tie a stitch right around the vascular bundle for the hemorrhoid. And then some surgeons, I'm um, included, will close that wound. Some surgeons will leave it open. It's a question of whether or not you think the patient's going to have pain from the open hemorrhoidectomy versus a closed hemorrhoidectomy. And there's some school of thought that the closed hemorrhoidectomy might cause more pain. And then there's some um, included that worry about bleeding afterwards, and I want to make sure that I've got a closure of the area. We always leave a little bit of space so that you can have some drainage because, as you can imagine, the anus is a dirty area. It's fraught for infection. Luckily, blood supply is very good down there, and so infection is rare. And this is what it looks like after having an open hemorrhoidectomy. So this is without the stitches for the closure. And you can see this is the left lateral hemorrhoid column that's been taken. This is the right posterior and the right anterior hemorrhoid columns that have been taken. And this picture, I think, illustrates why it's so painful, because it's actually a cut on perianal skin. You have a lot of extra sensory innervation down there. It's a sensitive area, and it'll hurt a lot. Um, the recurrence rate after this surgery is less than 5%, but they can recur in particular with patients who are still having problems with constipation, irritation, and having to strain a lot. Um, Again, it will reduce the mucosal prolapse. It helps to restore the functional anatomy, so it gets rid of all the extra baggage down there, and it restores the anus to the way that it, the way that it was when we were younger. And then um, it interrupts the blood, the blood supply that's going down into that hemorrhoid column. So on this picture here, this is actually a stitch that's right around the blood vessels leading down to that hemorrhoid column, so that interrupts the blood supply and helps it to not bleed anymore. A stapled hemorrhoid apexy is another way of treating hemorrhoids, and this is where we actually go through, we place a device into the rectum, into the, through the anus and into the rectum, and we use stitches to grab the hemorrhoid columns and pull them into the device. Afterwards, we place an anvil, which is this green thing here, and we attach it to a stapler. And then afterwards, we fire the stapler, so it actually cuts out the hemorrhoid columns and then leaves these staples behind which keep the mucosa intact. So if you were to imagine somebody pinching up your skin and then firing a stapler and cutting it at the same time, that's what this hemorrhoid surgery is doing, is it's cutting out that redundant tissue. And then again, these staples, they'll be with you, they'll be with you for a while. The problems with it, this is a surgery that is, that, you know, again, if I can get this to go. It's a surgery that's very durable and very successful in the right hands, but in, if somebody um, takes a bite that's a little bit too deep, because you can see that we're going with our suture right through here and the muscles right on the other side, um, you can grab other structures and you can have complications. So those complications include having pain and muscle spasms, because if the stitch is too deep, it'll incorporate part of the levator muscle, which is one of the pelvic floor muscles and that can cause spasm or defecation that can be there for up to a year to two years afterwards. Um, we also worry about abscesses being formed because, again, I'm cutting and stapling in the, in the rectum or in the anal canal. It's 
a lot of infect or there's a lot of bacteria there because that's where stool goes through. So there's a risk of having an abscess form, and there's a risk of getting a fistula. The worst thing that we would ever see in a woman would be for the vagina to actually be incorporated into that staple line, and that can cause an automatic what we call a rectovaginal fistula, which is a communication between the rectum and the vagina, and stools coming out through the vagina, which would be catastrophic. So you, know, you have to know what you're doing if you're doing this, um, elsewise you can, you can have some problems. Again, those problems are very rare, but they can occur. The transanal, this is, takes a while to learn how to say, but the transanal hemorrhoidal, or transanal hemorrhoidal dearterialization is a newer technique that's come out in the last couple of years, and what it does is it lets me use this device right here. This is the anoscope, and it has a little Doppler on it that tells me where the arteries are. So you have six feeding arteries for these three hemorrhoid columns. And then it has a stitch that, uh, that's very that's set for a de set determined depth so that I won't hook any extra tissue that I don't want. And it allows me to go about in a clockwise formation and find all six hemorrhoid vessels and ligate them. And then if patients have um, hemorrhoid prolapse, I can actually pexy those, and I'll show that in a minute. But it's nice because I'm actually able to hear the artery can tie it off and then I can always put the Doppler back in afterwards and listen to make sure that I've actually tied off the artery. And then this is a picture showing where the stitch is going through. This is the artery coming down. It's been tied off. And then here, this is called a baseball stitch, but basically it's one continuous running stitch that comes all the way down here. This is the, dent this is the um, dentate lines, that's where the sensation starts, so I don't want to go below that because patients are going to feel it. And once I've tied this down this way, I make my knot here, and then when I tie it, it shrinks all of this tissue up. So you can see here where this tissue is prolapsing down, and here where this tissue has actually been pulled up. And that's similar to what we're doing with the rubber band ligators and with the infrared coagulation, where we actually cause some scarring up to the muscle here to keep that hemorrhoid column up and in the rectum. And it's a safe procedure, um, has minimal complications. It can cause some pain or a sense of rectal fullness, again, because the hemorrhoids have been pulled up into the rectum. Uh, but it's a good technique for dealing with prolapsing and bleeding hemorrhoids. And this is a before and after, if you will. So this is the anus here. These are those redundant external hemorrhoid tags, as we call them. You can tell that they're not thrombosed hemorrhoids because they're not full and tight and purple. But these are some redundant skin folds, and then, excuse, bless you. and then after the surgery, you can see that the tissue has actually been pulled up and into the rectum. So we're going to kind of make a quick transition and talk about fecal incontinence, which is another subject that's near and dear to my heart. And um, remember your questions on the on hemorrhoids, and I'll be happy to answer those at the end of the at the end of the talk. Review kind of what the definition of fecal incontinence is. I'm sure that everybody in the room could tell you, but I'll tell you what the World Health Organization says it is. Why it's important. Talk about again some anatomy because it's hard to understand what's going on if you don't know the anatomy. Talk about reasons for fecal incontinence and what kind of what types of fecal incontinence there are, and then give you a little bit of an education as to what testing goes on because um, you know, there's a broad array of things that I send patients out for for fecal incontinence, then I don't want it to be a shock if anybody has to come to my office. And then also to talk about the therapies that we'll do in order to treat it. The definition is that patients can't control when or where they have a bowel movement. And we'll get into whether or not patients have any kind of sensation and what's going on with that. The true prevalence is unknown because as you can imagine, it's an embarrassing subject and nobody wants to talk about it. And it's been shown that it's been a, that it's up to 50% of patients that are in nursing homes, and in the general population on questionnaires, it's between 1.4% and 20% of patients that are walking, walking around on the street. And then unfortunately, when people are being cared for by their, by their children as we get older, it's one of the number one reasons for people to go into a nursing home care is once someone becomes incontinent, becomes, it becomes very difficult to take care of and very difficult to keep people clean. The types, there's urge incontinence, and that's where you actually feel that you need to go and you know that you have to go and if you don't get to the bathroom in a heartbeat, you're gonna have a problem in your pants. And then there's passive incontinence where my patients will come in and they talk to me about fecal smearing. There's some stool that's on their underwear when they take their underpants off. 
or patients who are going to the bathroom and they take their underwear down to go to the bathroom and they see that their stool and their underpants that they had no awareness of, they didn't know it was there at all. When it's passive and the internal anal sphincter is intact, that can come from damage such as radiation or nerve damage. And then if the internal sphincter is not intact, so if it's not a complete donut, and I'll show you on the anatomy how that looks, but if it's not a complete donut, we worry about trauma, either from what you think of as pelvic fractures, being in car accidents, or even obstetrical trauma in women from childbirth. And then also trauma from surgeries that we do as, as surgeons. In 1995, more than $26 billion was spent on uh, fecal and urinary incontinence in the U.S. and people over 65. So this is a very important matter and a lot is being done. So a lot of money is being spent towards it. And things that cause it are unfortunately time, getting older. As we get older, things don't work as well. The muscle itself will start to atrophy and weaken and it thins out and it can also have collagen formation within it so it's not working as well for you as you want it to. Again, obstetrical trauma, surgical trauma from having a hemorrhoidectomy as I showed you on the hemorrhoid slides, the internal anal sphincter and external anal sphincter are right there when we're taking the hemorrhoid off and it's easy to take it. There are other surgeries that we do for fistulas and fissures where we might accidentally cut part of the internal anal sphincter and that can render someone incontinent. Um, again, trauma, diabetes causes peripheral neuropathy and that can cause um, nerve damage and the nerve signals don't conduct as well and you have um, fecal incontinence from that. Multiple sclerosis, dementia, and then illnesses such as anything that can cause you to have diarrhea. As anybody knows, when you have a GI tract upset, we run into the bathroom every five minutes and we're having a hard time holding on to it. Again, more causes decreased function with aging, thinning of the tissues, things that we've talked about. When someone comes to my office, the things that I want to know about is what's the consistency of the stool? Are they having solid stool that's coming out, or is it diarrhea, or is it gas and liquid mixed as someone passes gas and has some staining of their underpants? Whether or not they're rushing to the bathroom, they have that urge incontinence, or if they're totally unaware that there's stool in their underpants whether or not they feel like they're completely able to evacuate their rectum after a bowel movement, or if something feels like it's still there and they're not able to get it out. Whether or not there are any bulges or masses, um, whether they've had anorectal surgery, uh, vaginal deliveries or episiotomies, and then also whether or not the patients have radiation, either from cervical cancer, rectal cancer, or prostate cancer. We're gonna take a look at the underpants and see what kind of smearing there is. We're gonna look up the at the, the perineum is the bottom, and we're gonna look and see if there are any scars from trauma or surgeries. And then also we'll spread the anus and see if the anus itself will dilate on its own and if the patient's able to constrict it and see what their function is. And then as you're coming to my office, I try to have small fingers, but you're gonna, your patient's gonna have a digital exam so that I can evaluate the anus, see what the internal anal sphincter tone is, see how strong that muscle is, but also see how the patient's able to respond by squeezing down on my finger to make sure the external anal sphincter works. When we talk about anatomy, um, your anal, your, excuse me, your anus is about two to four centimeters in size. Unfortunately, women have a shorter anus than guys do because of the vagina and having a shorter perineal body. There's less tissue there for the anus. And then this rectum, which is right above the anus, that's the last line in the colon, that's the storage vessel. It's about 15 to 20 centimeters. In the anus, you have an internal and an external anal sphincter, and the yellow is the internal anal sphincter. And again, that's what gives you your tone. That's why everybody's able to walk around all day long and not have accidents on themselves, is because of that tone from the internal anal sphincter. It's not a muscle that you can control, it's actually a muscle that your underlying brain systems are controlling. It's not something that your higher brain systems can control. Your external anal sphincter, that's the one that's on the outside, and it's a skeletal muscle. So the inside, excuse me, the internal anal sphincter is a smooth muscle, so it can stay tight for a prolonged period of time, whereas the external anal sphincter being a skeletal muscle, it has fatigue. So it's the muscle that if you're sitting there in a meeting and you feel like you need to pass wind, it can tighten up, no accidents happen, and then your internal anal sphincter will tighten up again. Your external sphincter will have about four to five minutes and then it'll start to relax on its own or when you tell it to relax. Another thing that's important 
in terms of continence is a muscle called the pubo rectalis. This is a muscle that comes from the pubis, it slings around the rectum in a U shape, and it comes back to the pubis, so it kind of holds it up just like this. And at rest, there's a 90 degree angle there, and it creates a flat valve in the rectum so that the stool, once it comes down, it's not going out like a, like a slide. And then when people are trying to actually hold on to it and not have a bowel movement, this pubic rectalis will contract, and that increases this angle to about 75 degrees, so this stool is not able to come out through the rectum. And then when it's time to have a bowel movement and we feel more comfortable about it, we're in a socially appropriate place, it relaxes, and then you can see it makes this nice straight line, and the stool comes right down the chute. Things that determine continence are uh, whether or not patients feel it. So there's a lot of sampling that goes on, and it's pretty interesting, but as stool comes down, the internal anal sphincter will dilate, and then it will allow the, the sensory receptors and venous to figure out if it's liquid, if it's solid, or if it's gas. If it's liquid or if it's solid and we're not in a place where we can have a bowel movement, the external sphincter will tighten up and the internal sphincter will regain its tone. The stool is put back up into the rectum and you can go about your business. And if you're in a place where or you're in a bathroom and you can relax, the external anal sphincter will relax and the stool comes on down. And then I'm not quite sure who Admiral Rollins is, but I like this quote very much. But it just goes to show that the anus several times a day is doing more for you than your hands by discriminating between liquid, solid, and gas and letting the gas out but keeping the liquids and the solids out. One thing that matters is how fast things are coming down the pipe. So if you've got Niagara Falls coming down the rectum and fill, or coming down the colon and filling up the rectum, you've got to get to the bathroom quick. If things are moving around slow, then your rectum has a chance to have, have um, compliance and distend, and then you can you have, you have a better chance of being continent because you don't have that pressure, that extra sensation to have to get to the bathroom. In addition, there's consistency of the delivery. So as we said, there's there are mechanoreceptors and sensory receptors within the anus that let you know if it's liquid or solid. The anus does a great job of holding on to solids, and it does a Okay job of holding on to liquids, and then as any guy can tell you, it does a terrible job of holding on to gas. <laughs> we also care about sensation and whether or not you're able to feel it. And that can come whether you have an awareness of it, what's going on in the anus if those nerves are intact, and whether or not there's a disconnect between the two. So if there's trauma and you don't and you have no sensation, or if they're from diabetes or other neuro neuropathic problems, you have no sensation in your anus. Etiology, so where, where's this problem coming from? There's nerve integrity, and so here this shows you the sacral nerves that are coming off the tailbone, if you will, and then they're coming around from the side. So if there's any trauma to this area, so sometimes patients will come in and they've had an abscess or abscess surgery, Part of what we do is we have to break up the abscess and the loculations within it. If somebody gets a little too aggressive, they can actually go through some nerves and not realize it and go through those nerves and actually have decreased innervation of the anus. We worry about whether or not the muscle's intact. And this is an example of somebody who's had uh, an episiotomy from childbirth. And you can see where the cut has been made at the base of the vagina and it's actually gone through the internal and external anal sphincter and that then has to be repaired. Over time, the scar tissue that's there can thin, because if the scar tissue doesn't contract, it can thin out and dilate, and that's why women, after having an episiotomy, can become incontinent later on in years. We worry about rectal compliance, so how well is your rectum working for you? Can it fill up like a balloon and go around all day long carrying a stool and then evacuate once a day or once every three days? Or if they had surgery, and now we have more rigid pipes, or if they've had radiation, which causes scarring of the rectum, so the rectum loses its compliance. So once something comes down and fills the rectum, it can't distend and hold on to it, so you have to evacuate it because stuff's coming there, because stool is coming down. And then also we worry about incomplete emptying. So patients are, when they come in and we do our history, and they say that they still feel like they have stool that's in their bottom, Think about it as a funnel. So the, the tip of the funnel is going to be the anus, the top of the funnel is going to be the rectum. If somebody's impacted and they have a couple of large stool balls in there or even one large piece of stool, 
They're not able to, they're not able to evacuate it because it's too hard. Things will back up. You get liquid that builds up. The rectum's constantly trying to squeeze down and get this um, stool out. And then patients will have drippage onto their underpants or seepage of liquid stool coming out. And again, it all comes down to patient education and letting people know that there are fixes for this. Again, 20% of people walking around have 20% of people walking around have this problem. And it's probably even more, we just don't know about it. The reasons why they're not coming to see me, well, the first thing is that they're not talking to their doctors about it. The other reason is that some people, they just don't know that there are surgeries out there that we can do to try to fix these things. And then, as you'll see, until recently, all of the surgeries that I can do to fix incontinence have a high morbidity, which means that it has a high complication rate. And I'll show you why in just a few minutes. And then, also, medical management is very successful. If I can decrease the amount of um, liquid stool, if I can make stool more solid, make it easier for that anus to hold on to it, I can cure more than 50% of people from their incontinence troubles. Again, going over that. And then in addition to working on their diet, we can do biofeedback and then use um, medical agents in order to help slow things down. For non-surgical, again, we get into the diet and the bulk forming agents. Um, constipating agents such as Imodium, things that are going to slow down the intestine and help to deep pull the water out of the um, intestinal contents in the core. Um, and then we can do perineal strengthening with Kegel exercises. And then we can do biofeedback, which I'll get into in just a moment. Just a quick refresher on all the things that are out there in order to increase the amount of fiber that's in your diet. The medications, again, as I said, the goal is to actually slow down intestinal motility. So if diarrhea is running through the colon, then it's going to be liquid, hard for the anus to hold on to, and it's like having Niagara Falls come down. But if I can slow down the transit rate through the colon, we can pull more water out, because that's the main function of the colon. The colon is there to pull water out of the intestinal contents, and it'll make it more solid and easier to hold on to. And these are some of the drugs that are used. I like to start with Imodium. It's available in a liquid form. It's more easily absorbed. And then moving down to Lamotyl, and then as last line agents, I use tincture of opium and sometimes somatostatin, which is a drug, it's a hormone in the body, it's called the universal stop, and it helps to slow down the gut. Biofeedback is something that's very important, so a lot of patients come through and they don't, they have um, an inability to have a good bowel movement, and they also don't have a very strong anus, so they actually have anal physical therapists, which when I started my training, I didn't realize that this was even a profession, who are out there who can help patients. And what they do is they take the finger and they put it in, in the patient's bottom, have them squeeze down. Because one thing that we find is that I'll ask somebody to squeeze down on my finger and they're not able to. But if I leave my finger there and then I ask them to squeeze down again, then I'm able to get a little bit of a sensation. I ask them to squeeze down a third time and I'm able to get a little bit more. So it's like physical therapy, just like when people are bed bound and they're weak and they need to have physical therapy to get stronger so they can walk and run, your anus can get the same kind of physical therapy to get stronger and learn how to have better function. And the physical therapist is there to be able to tell people how well they're working towards their goals, what's going on in their bottom, because some patients think that they're pushing down when really they're actually pulling things in and tightening up and not allowing the stool to come down or not learning how to relax. And it's been shown that up to 50% of people with incontinence can actually get better with diet and with biofeedback. And as I said, with hemorrhoid surgery, if I can fix you without operating, that's always a preference because operations always can have complications. When we think about assessing people and we want to see what's going on, there are certain studies that need to be done. And one of those is having an anal ultrasound. So what the anal ultrasound does is it allows me to actually see the anus and see how tall it is, it lets me see how thick it is, and it also lets me see if there's a break in it. So here, this is the internal anal sphincter. Now a lot of ultrasounds, they look like cloud patterns, and so you have to stare at these for a long time before you start seeing it, but here you can see this black thing that looks like a C. And this is the anterior part of where the vagina would be. Back here is where the tailbone would be. And you can see that there's a clear break in the internal anal sphincter here. 
And so this is a patient who in the past has had an episiotomy, has had scar tissue that formed after they had their internal anal sphincter rebuilt by the gynecologist at the time of uh, delivery. But then over time, that scar tissue has, has thinned out and the anus has actually opened up a little bit. And so this right here is a, you know, we measure the angle from here to the inside of the black disc. This is actually the probe that's in the anus and the rectum. And then back out to here, and this is about a 110 degree defect in the, in the anus. We also do pudendal nerve testing, an EMG. And what this is, is the previous surgery that I'll show you, that we, or this, one of the surgeries that we do is an overlapping sphincteroplasty, but I want to know that when I do this surgery and fix the anus that it's going to work, that it still has innervation. So unfortunately, it's a painful test. Um, there's an electrode that's placed into the, into the rectum and it's placed right at the levator muscle. So once you get over the top of the anus and you hook your finger, you can actually feel the levator muscle which forms the pelvic floor. That's what keeps every, all the intestinal contents on the inside. And then it sends a sharp electrical signal that then the glove actually picks up here at the base of the finger down by the anus. So it hurts, it's like a pinprick in the anus, but it gives me a good determination of what's going on with the nerves, what the nerve function is, and that helps me to figure out what kind of surgery this patient's gonna get later on. We're gonna do anal manometry as well, and this is actually part of biofeedback. So it comes into training patients. So one of the things that's done is we will inflate balloons in the rectum and figure out when the patient first gets a feeling of having rectal sensation which should be between 30 and 60 cc's in the balloon. Some patients, they can have 120 cc's in the balloon or 300 cc's in the balloon, and they don't even know that there's distension of the rectum. And so that leads them to not know when they need to go to the bathroom and evacuate when they get overflow in condoms. The other test, which again, I didn't know that you could do until I went into my profession, is called defecography. And so this is what I, most of my patients come back to me and tell me that this was the more embarrassing thing than anything else, but it gives me a good idea of anatomy. And what happens is that paste that's, um, it's barium paste that shows up on x-rays is actually placed into the rectum. And we do it in the MRI, we place jelly up into the rectum. And then we have a toilet bowl seat that the patient sits on and we take fluoroscopic images, which are live x-rays, and we actually watch as the patient bears down and has that contrast come out of the rectum and through the anus. And it'll tell us about what's going on in the rectum. So here, this is what is called a rectocele. So this is where, instead of the rectum being a nice tube coming down to the anus and evacuating, when the patient bears down, all the stool is going up here into this pouch that's forming, and it's a thinning between the rectum and the vagina, so the stool is actually pushing out into the vagina. And a lot of my patients that will come through tell me about having to put their fingers in the vagina to actually have the stool come out because of this large bulge. It will also tell me about what I call perineal descent, how well the perineum is relaxing and allowing stool to come down. And it tells me if there's anything else anatomically that could be fixed other than having to work on the sphincters because I want to make sure that I'm doing the right surgery for the right patient. As far as surgical treatments are concerned, the mainstay for us used to be, and still is, a sphincteroplasty, an overlapping sphincteroplasty for patients who have a defect in their sphincter, typically from trauma. So that's, that's that ultrasound that we showed where you saw the internal anal sphincter that was not completely around. We did, in 1992, start using artificial anal sphincters. That's technology that we stole from the urologists for urinary incontinence, and it's a, I'm going to show you that, but it's a cuff that goes around the anus and can help with continence. The ultimate thing that I can do that nobody ever wants to have is a colostomy. And that's where we actually make a colostomy and the patient wears a bag and stool comes out into the bag. Nobody ever wants that. But if they are so incontinent that they're not able to get out of the house, they're not able to go to church, they can't play bridge with their friends, sometimes this is preferable than not being able to get out of the house and do anything. We also can do muscle transpositions, and I'll show you what that means. But basically, God gave us extra parts, and we can use those parts to help out. And in this case, we use muscles from the leg in order to help bolster the anus. And then there's a what's called a SECA procedure, which I'll show you. And then um, new on the market, which has become available for my profession, um, colorectal surgery and fecal incontinence is using sacral stimulation to actually cause the sphincter to tighten up. It's been used in the urologic practice for a long period of time, and it's been shown to help out with fecal incontinence, but it was just FDA approved a few months ago 
for us to be able to use it with fecal incontinence. And then also using injectables, which has been done in Europe, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and it's just recently been approved to be done here in the U.S. An overlapping sphincter repair is where, again, there's been trauma to the anus, and there's actually a break in the internal anal sphincter, and it won't come together, and that's why patients are incontinent. In order to be able to fix it, I need to at least have 50% um, circumference of the anus. If it's any more, if I've lost more than 50% of the internal anal sphincter, once I close that thing up, it makes the anus too tight and the patients won't be able to have a bowel movement. So if it's any more than 50%, I'm not able to do this surgery. Um, they do have to have a functional mechanism with the nerve conduction in order to actually have the sphincter work. Okay. So that's where we send patients for the pudendal nerve testing, which is that test that hurts so much. It gives me very important information to figure out if the nerve function is intact. We do preserve the scar tissue because when we put stitches through muscle, muscle does not hold on to stitches very well. So we actually use the scar tissue that was there in order to help the repair to stay intact. And then, um, again, we want to avoid damaging the pudendal nerve, which is coming in from the outside, lateral, and then coming into the anus. And this is what it looks like. We make a cut in the skin. This is where you see the internal anal, anal sphincter is dotted out here. There's half of it. We find the ends and then we bring them together in an overlapping fashion and then sew them back together. And it's been shown initially to work very well, 60-80%. That's Those are very good numbers for somebody who is completely incontinent and couldn't get about. However, over after we check on these people five years later, only about 20% of them remain continent. And that's either because the stitches eventually start to slip or because of the scar tissue again, there's thinning of the anus and it'll, it'll uh, lose some of its anal tone. And this is the worst picture that you'll have to look at, but this illustrates what we do, where this is a cut in the perineum. And here is the actual internal anal sphincter that we've, that we've identified on either side, and you can see where the break is. We overlap those two pieces, and then in order to get this closed, this is what everything looks like when it's closed up. And so that helps to explain a little bit about the complications from it. Again, you know, um, the, excuse me, for the complications, we, it's, a, it's a moist area. We've got a lot of bacteria because these patients do not have a protective colostomy. We've learned that you don't have to do a protective colostomy in order to do an overlapping sphincterplasty. But about half of these wounds are going are to fall apart. And when I say that, I mean that the skin is going to separate. The anus will stay intact, but the skin will separate and then have to heal by what we call secondary intention, which is when you allow an open wound to close in on its own. And again, the reason why is because if we leave it open, it won't form an abscess and won't cause problems because the bacteria are easily able to move out and not actually form a cavity. And so these patients have to have a sitz bath or take a bath every time they have a bowel movement. If 50% of these wounds are falling apart, we help their continence. But again, for about a two to three month period of time, they're healing up from their wounds. Other things that we can do are muscle transpositions. So with the gluteus muscle, that's the butt muscle, if you will. We're actually able to take part of it and overlap it um, over to the sphincter. The problem is that skeletal muscles are not very good muscles for being able to hold tone for a prolonged period of time. So you have to train patients how to, how to squeeze their butt muscles in order to keep the sphincter closed um, and that muscle will fatigue. The fix that they came up with was a little stimulator device that actually can um, stimulate the muscle to be tonically contracted. And then when it's time to have a bowel movement, the patient removes the stimulation from the, they turn it off basically, and then they're able to have a bowel movement. And what that looks like is you make two large cuts, you find a portion of the gluteus, you're not taking the whole thing because we won't be able to still walk. We take a portion of the gluteus, we wrap it around the anus, and then that actually provides extra tissue and extra bulk, and it provides some tension. The gluteus muscle, you can imagine this is kind of a difficult operation to do, so another thing that has been done is the gracilis muscle. Now this is a muscle that's in the medial thigh, so we can take this muscle, harvest it if you will, we keep its vascular attachment where it is down here, swing it around, wrap it around the anus, and then attach it to the other side. And then this is that neurostimulator that actually applies 
an electrical signal to cause that muscle to be tonically contracted down. Because again, it's skeletal muscles, and if you were to try to hold a 25 pound sack of flour in one arm for all day long, you wouldn't be able to. Eventually that muscle is going to fatigue and drop. So this electrical stimulation helps it to stay tonically active. It works very well. Again, 60% of patients see some improvement. However, in the U.S., they didn't approve the neurostimulators. So this has been done in Europe and on trials in the U.S., but it's not something that's actually done here yet. But again, when we look at the data, you can see that 15 patients, so they took 17 patients for this U.S. study, and out of those, 15 patients had to have 20 additional operations. And the reason for that is from wound infections, or complications or not being able to have the gracilis muscles stay in place. So that's a lot of morbidity or extra surgery or complications from this procedure. Eventually we were able to come up with the artificial anal sphincter and as I mentioned that's what we stole from the urologist and we thought that this was going to be a panacea. We thought that this would help us out a lot uh, with fecal incontinence. And what it is is you have a balloon reservoir here you have a little cuff that goes right around the anus and the rectum, and you have a pump that activates and transfers water from the cuff back to the balloon and vice versa. The cuff, again, sits around the anus, and then the activating switch for patients is in women in the labia and in men in the scrotum, and it's something that you squeeze. And what happens is that when you pump it, Water is taken from the cuff, which is constricting down on the, on the anus, puts it in the balloon, and then for two to three minutes, that cuff is deflated, and that allows patients to evacuate and have a bowel movement. And then because this cuff is elastic, it starts to squeeze down, and over two to three minutes, it fills that, excuse me, because the balloon is elastic, it starts to squeeze down, and over two to three minutes, the cuff around the anus inflates again, and that provides enough tissue bulk in order for patients to be continent, to be able to walk around. It is a good device, however, it also comes with complications. As you can imagine, as we've said previously, it's a dirty area, lots of bacteria around, it's a surgical wound, it's moist, and there's about a 50% wound infection rate. And unfortunately, unlike the muscle, which is part of us, and we can actually get that to heal, this is plastic, so if it becomes infected, it has to be taken out. So for about 50% of people, this will work very, very well. Uh, the other 50% and I have no way of knowing before the operation, you know, there, are, there are risks. Now a lot of people are willing to take those risks and we put these devices in them and again, when they work for them, they're very happy. But when they're not working, we do cause some problems. And then also, it's a mechanical device, so at some point there's going to be a mechanical failure and we might have to swap out parts of it or you run into leaking. So, when I talk to patients about a colostomy, it drops on them like a ton of bricks. And nobody wants it. However, there's a lot, a wide body of literature out there that once I get someone out a year from having the surgery and they've gotten used to dealing with the bag and they've seen how they've been able to get out and live their life, they can go back to church, they can play bridge, they can play poker, they can get out and go to the movies and hang out with their friends, it's not as bad as it initially seemed. One thing that can be done for patients is to have the colostomy and patients will sometimes do their own irrigation. So in the morning, they'll instill a liter of normal saline into their colon through their stoma. That'll induce a cathartic bowel movement, kind of like doing it, it's basically doing an enema through their colostomy. And then they're able to put a little bandage on and not have to wear their bag and be able to go around through the day without having to deal with the colostomy. <laughs> the other thing is called a MACE procedure. And this is similar because I'm still bringing intestine up to the skin and making a connection, but this time I'm bringing up the appendix. So it has to be somebody with an appendix. So if they've had an appendectomy, they're off the list for this. But what it does is it brings the appendix right up to the skin. And you can see this gentleman here is taking a small catheter and putting it through. And you can see how small this hole is. Again, it instills a liter of normal saline into the colon and it's a prograde enema that they'll stay as they're instilling it sit on the toilet and they'll have their bowel movement and then they're able, they've completely cleaned out their colon and they're able to move about their day and not have to worry about incontinence. Again, these are more invasive procedures and this is what I think about sort of at the end of the line. If we've tried everything and I'm not able to help somebody out, that's when I bring these things up. This is certainly not what I talk to patients about on their first visit when they're coming to me to talk about fecal incontinence. 
The second procedure has been around since about 2003. It was started by a company. That company went out of business. The technology was bought by someone else and has recently been coming around again. And what it uses is radio frequency ablation. So radio frequency ablation has been around for a while. It's been used to treat everything from sleep apnea to snoring to heart irregularities. And what happens is that there are tiny little prongs that come out and they actually heat up the tissue around the, around the rectum in this case and around the anus. And that heated tissue causes scarring and that scarring then causes strictures or tightening so the anus actually becomes a tighter organ so the patients have a little bit better control. And this is just a pictograph that shows where the tides are going in into the internal anal sphincter here. Again, this shows you where the areas are. It takes about 15 to 30 minutes and it's done under sedation with patients you know, sleepy but not with the breathing tube. And then here you get to see how the anus itself tightens up from the scar tissue formation from this device. And when it was used, it's been used in a lot of different centers and they found that more than 50% of people are helped. And again, when you think about the other surgeries that I can do for this, which I consider to be you know, maximal things with a high risk, a high gain, but a high risk, this is minimal risk with a high gain. So this is causing a little bit of damage. Um, there is a risk of abscess formation. There is a risk because I'm working around the anus and the rectum of having problems with the bladder, but it is a nice way of trying to fix things. And again, the risks are low unlike some of the other things that I can do. Sacral stimulation has just become approved in the last six to nine months within the last year. And we've been very excited about this coming out, but it's a way for us to actually implant a neurostimulator into the sacrum, which is your tailbone, and it can stimulate the nerve fibers that are living there and actually help increase your sensation in the perineum so you know when you need to go to the bathroom, and also give you a little bit of extra tone to the internal anal sphincter. And this shows how it's, uh, it's actually a percutaneous implant. I'm not having to cut the skin very much. I'm not actually cutting down to the muscle. I'm not actually looking at the nerves and running the risk of causing damage from that. I'm taking a probe and putting it in under um, x-ray guidance so that I can see what's going on and putting the tines exactly where I need them. Before getting this, I have patients keep a bowel diary for a couple of weeks and then they actually have the implant done because it's, because it's a two-stage procedure. <coughs> Once the procedure has been done, if they come back um, and they have another bowel diary that they do for another couple of weeks, it's two weeks. If they have a improvement by 50% of all of their symptoms, then we put in the final stimulator package and have that implant in there. And if, they're, if not, then we actually are able to remove the whole thing. Since it's only been in at two weeks, the risk of damage um, in the area from scar tissue is very minimal. Again, it was first thought that we could only use this device in a sphincter that was intact, but as we've been working with it, we've actually started using it in sphincters that have had a break in them. Because again, you know, the obstetric trauma that caused a break in that internal anal sphincter happened many, many years ago. Patients weren't incontinent in their 30s, it's only in their 50s and 60s when they become incontinent from that obstetric trauma. So it's thinning of the muscles. So the idea was, well, maybe if we give them a little bit of extra oomph down there with this stimulator that they can have better control. And we found that we can actually have patients that have up to um, almost 50% loss can still have improvement just from the extra neurostimulation. And some people have actually had their incontinence, which was eight to 11 times a week, drop down to less than one. Again, this was a quick study that showed that 83% of people who were in the study had at least a 50% improvement in their quality of life and in their fecal incontinence score. Injectable bulking is something that has been used in Europe for a while, and the idea here is, again, remember back to the hemorrhoid talk, that the hemorrhoids are vascular cushions that give you extra tissue around the anus to allow stool to not leak out. And so by injecting things around the anus, I'm able to build up that mucosa once again help give you a little bit of a cushion. And what happens here with that is that we're injecting up underneath the um, lining of the anus and the rectum, building up those hemorrhoid columns and giving a little bit of extra tissue there to help out. Just a quick slide showing that 53% of patients had 50% improvement, which is slightly better than the 30% of patients who just had injection with water. However, this is a minimal risk 
for a lot of gain, and I like things that are minimal risk for a lot of gain to start off with and to see if they work. Um, again, one thing that I want to have everybody understand is that the treatments that we use, so these are a lot of treatments, and as you've seen, some of them carry a lot of risk and can have a lot of problems. Some of them will work very well for some people and some will, work, will not work very well for others. So we try to get an idea from the patients what their problem is in terms of being embarrassed, being able to get out and live their life, functionally what the problem is, whether or not it's a problem with stool consistency, if it's a, an issue with being able to have biofeedback help, and have some cognitive help in order to um, improve anal control, or if they're going to go on and need surgery. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time.